Luke uh, 22 and 54, it says, And having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the uh, high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. And now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, you are also of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are saying. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this passage. We thank you, Lord, for the truth that is before us, God. We pray that the Holy Spirit, the teacher, would be here with us as we go through these verses, Lord God, that we might glean to understand some portion of what it is that happened to you and what happened in your life, what happened in Peter's life and the disciples' lives, Lord. Help us to understand it. Help us to have clarity, Lord, and help us to apply your truth that we've drawn out of it, Father God, that we might know you in a deeper way. In Jesus' name, amen. And so as we've been tracking along, I've been kind of telling you what day of the week it is. And here we're obviously, we're at Friday. and We're going to be on Friday here, even into the next chapter here. But this is Passion Week, Friday on Passion Week. And, and, and understand this because the term passion not only means this is an emotional time for the Lord of him enduring all of these things. The, 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 the word passion translates to suffering. It is a week of suffering from him. It is a week of suffering that Latin basis suffer. So he, he has here been rejected by his people. He's suffering from that. He's suffering from the betrayal of his people. He's suffering from heavy temptation, suffering from physical beating. We'll see some of that today as well. And ultimately suffering from the sin that he'll bear from you and I, being separate from holiness, being separate from the Father, which is the most painful. But Jesus has endured. He's prayed through anguish, through temptation, all the way to the point of sweating blood. But he's finally accepted, fully accepted, the cup of judgment that is being passed to him. He said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. That is the heart that we should have. It's okay to put your plan and tell God about what your plan is. But ultimately, he said, Lord, your plan trumps my plan. So whatever it is you want to do, I want to do that. And Jesus says, I'm full submission of you. And so Judas here, if you've been following along, has, has betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver and has brought an entourage. He has brought him along with him uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane here, and they've arrested him. And listen, uh, go to John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John real quick, 18. Now I'm going to go ahead and warn you before we get in this. I am bouncing all over the place today. I'm going through, I'm going to use all the gospels here to bring clarity to this thing. John 18 and three, look, look at this, because this is more details to the picture in which we stopped last week. John 18 and three, it says this, it says, then Judas having received the detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. And Matthew even says that they brought clubs. I mean, they came for some business, right? And Jesus, therefore, knowing all the things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with him. Chomp, ain't that right? That, that's all I could think of when I saw that. I was like, look at you. That's all I could think about when I read that. So this entourage, I, I want to, because I kind of left some of these details out last time. This entourage that is here, this is a deep entourage. This isn't like eight dudes that came up like bell bondsmen to come to get a dude. It's not like that at all. There's troops here. There's likely there's several hundred people that are here that have showed up to, to, to take Jesus down. And actually the term, if you go look into the term detachment here, it's anywhere from 200 to 1,000 men. You know, this is a lot of people that are here. And they're all girded up, got their weapons, got their lanterns, and obviously feel for his, of his power. Because remember what Jesus said, you come and arrest me like I'm a robber, is what he said to them. But here's the kicker. Look at verse 6. Now, when he said this to them, I am he, they drew back and they fell to the ground. Jesus declared his deity and by the sheer power of his proclamation knocked them to their behinds. I am he. Whew. Hundreds of men hit the ground. 
because he said that, y'all. Just think about that for a moment, right? Just by his sheer power of just proclaiming who he was. And in verse 8 said, Jesus answered, I told him, told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let those go their way. And that, that uh, saying this, he might be fulfilled what was spoken of. Those whom gave me, I have lost none. Jesus is saying, this is the purpose of him allowing him to go. He said, there's a point and a purpose that this has to be fulfilled. Jesus is allowing him to be arrested and going with him. The man spoke who he was and they fell. There were no contests for him. Once again, this is what I'm trying to tell y'all, that people that deny this, this is God's plan from start to finish. He is orchestrating every single part of this thing. He says who I am. They drop to the, how are you going to arrest that guy? Unless he turns around, puts his hands on the back and just goes with you. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, he, he, he's like the, the, you know, the poster child of submission when the police pull you over. Just, hey, just go, hey, we can argue tomorrow, live tonight. He had all the power in his hands. Listen, our, our, our Savior, it's not that they killed him because they're, they're going to kill him, but he's surrendering his life, y'all. We, we, we can't forget that. He, he has power over death. And obviously with his words, he can make men fall to their feet. I mean, it's just, it's just his submission here. God's plan from start to finish. Not Satan, not Judas, not the religious leaders who we've seen are just basically pawns in the story here, but God's sovereign plan for redemption for you and I. And then today in our verse-by-verse -verse journey here in Luke that we've been going through for a while now, Jesus' prophecy from verse 34 is going to be fulfilled where Peter denies him. A low point in Peter's life. Peter's been an amazing guy. I mean, he, he has been, but what's happened to him is he, he has this thing where he gets a little spiritually overconfident. I like to say spiritual arrogance is what he has here. And even though that, 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 that there's a lot for us to learn in here, I think that's the key point to the message today, even though there's a lot of other things that I'll talk about here, is that it's about spiritual arrogance, that we're not to get too spiritually high. I think the true spirituality of a man says that I'm low. That's the true spirituality. The maturity says, I got to stay on my knees. I ain't nothing special. I think that's the maturity here. So let's dive into this and let's see uh, some of the life of Apostle Peter here. And, and, and let's, let's see what we can glean from this, what we can see in the story. Because if you look at this particular section here that's here in Luke, Luke like zooms through it. There's not a lot that he talks about Peter's denial. It's really short here, but there's a lot more that's here. And I'm going to draw some of those out from the other gospel so we can paint a better picture. So here in verse 54 is where we're starting at. It says, having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter uh, followed at a distance. And uh, as the as I said before, we're going to look at Mark, we're going to look at Matthew, we're going to look at John to pull these details out. Uh, and here's the thing. It makes this a little bit more realistic, Right? It makes us a lot more realistic. If you go into all of the Gospels here that are here and everybody's saying the exact same things, you'd say that's a lie. If all of the people that came here yesterday and cleaned up and you asked them what happened yesterday, you're going to hear some of the same stuff, but you're going to hear it from a different angle. You're going to hear it from a different perspective. You're going to hear from what they did and what they saw immediately was there. Now, they're gonna, you're going to arrive at the fact that the back was cleaned by somebody, but you might have cleaned the windows up front. But when you get all those people in the room together, all of a sudden we find out what happened on Saturday and how the place got cleaned. And that's what my plan is to try to weave this thing together so we can look at details here and really come out with a clean painted picture um, that we can wrap our minds around. But it's more realistic that, that, that some of them have angles and some of them don't have those angles and some have details and some of them don't because they're different personalities. And I think that's important. Uh, we were talking about the Calvary Chapel movie, and it's like, yeah, I said, yeah, you got to read like a whole bunch of books to listen to a bunch of people say a bunch of things that really wrap your mind around it because they didn't know it was going to be what it, what it turned out to be. So nobody's writing all this stuff down, but there's different perspectives, and I think that's a beautiful thing about the Lord and how, because not one of us can catch everything that he does. Our minds are finite, amen? But we can get these angles. Now, you're going to follow me around here and wrap my minds around this thing. So, here Luke doesn't record that Jesus has an appearance before Caiaphas here. He's arrested and he's taken, uh, he's taken to Caiaphas here, um, actually secondly, because he's actually the high priest. Uh, uh, Annas uh, is uh, Caiaphas' father-in-law. They actually go to him first. Now, Luke doesn't record any of that here, but we have it here. And this is, this is 
left out. I'm not really sure exactly why, but Luke really doesn't pick up until verse 66 where it's actually daytime and the official interrogation and trial actually begins. And so there's a lot of details in here that I think that are really good. But he leaves the situation out here. Uh, but he's going to wait. Luke's going to wait until daybreak to, to do his part. Now, it's likely that Annas and Caiaphas live in the same building here. So if you're reading all of the all the different gospels here, you can come with the idea that, men they move from spot to spot to spot. But what happens is An uh, Annas and Caiaphas are probably most likely in the same building, in the same complex um, where there are different living quarters. And, and what happens is, and this was typical, right? So what would happen is maybe Annas had a part and then Caiaphas had another part. And then in the middle was the courtyard of the building in which they lived in. So if you really go through the Gospels and read, it's like, man, they're moving around. They're really not going that far. They're really coming in and going into this particular courtyard that is between their living quarters. Now, this wouldn't have been particularly uncommon for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, they're family, right? And they're serving in the high priest. Now, Annas is the former high priest. Caiaphas is the serving uh, appointed priest at this time. But really, Annas is the one that has the power. And that's the reason why they go to him first, because he's really the boss. Now, he, he's not, he's, he's been removed by Rome from his power, but yet he's still the main influencer here, right? And plus, he's, his son-in-law is the high priest, but he's dead. Because he's married to his daughter. He's dead here. And so they bring it to him first. And not only that, folks, it wasn't uncommon for those people that were wealthy to have a compound to live in that would share a courtyard. And how did they get rich? We talked about this already because Jesus turned the tables over. They came through. They were crooked. They had a dirty business. So they were wealthy from their dirty business that Jesus had tore loose. So it makes sense that they were there in the same quarters, that they're very wealthy, that they're in the same courtyard together here where, where the scene is really you know, taking place here. And Matthew and John give us details on Jesus' appearance before them. Um, before Jesus is brought to Caiaphas, he's brought to Annas. And this is kind of the flow here. You know, they arrested him. They take him in. The whole entourage gets him, and they bring him over to Annas first. Now, we'll see that all through this, that this whole thing is orchestrated and planned out way ahead because the Sanhedrin is already, already in place. Now, park this in the back of your mind. This is late, 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 late. This is like early the next day. So it possibly could be 1, 2, 3 in the morning when all this is going on. But yet, this is all orchestrated and put in place. This was all planned here all set out here um, to see. Now, if you would turn really quick to John, there's more details. So if you turn to John, uh, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, 18 and 12 here, 18 and 12, we, we pick up a couple more details that I think are important to understand what's going on. So Jesus is arrested, right? He's brought to Annas, and, 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 and let's look at what it says. It says here in John 18 and 12, it says, Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. We talked about that. And they led him away to Annas first. That's what it says, right? For he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now, also, if you slide down here, look down at verse 19, right? The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. And Jesus answered, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, have, uh, I, have said, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me uh, what I said to them. And indeed, they know what I said. And when he, when he had said these things, one of the officers stood by him uh, stood, stood by, struck Jesus with the palm of his hand saying, do you answer the high priest like that? And Jesus answered him, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil, but if, but if well, why do you strike me? And then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Annas, see, they, they brought him to Annas first because they wanted to go ahead and find fault in him. We need to go ahead and dig and find something to get this thing rolling, get this thing done with. And he goes before and Jesus is just completely honest. He's like, what have I done? I preach to you in the public, in the temple. All, what have I done? You have been there all the time. And everything that I've said, you've heard everything. There's nothing hidden. There's no secret. We're out here. We're not in the darkness. This is all light. That's why it's always weird when you have these religions or these so-called things that Christianity is, they won't come to your church, but you got to come to theirs. There's no windows on their building. What's going on right now? You can't go into their sanctuary. What's weird? I thought we was in the light, not the darkness. And he said, there's nothing in the darkness because the Bible tells us what does light have to do with the darkness? Only thing the darkness can do for the light is make it shine brighter. 
He said, I got nothing hidden. Everything about the ministry, everything about the doctrine has been open and straightforward in front of you. And Annas is like, okay, well, pass them on to my son-in-law. Maybe he can find something wrong with him because he just killed his case right there. And he was just being open and honest with him. Nothing crafty going on here. He just told him the truth. Now, so he's been arrested. He goes to Annas. Annas can't find anything. Jesus is open and honest and straightforward with him. And now he moves and takes him in front of Caiaphas. So we have to leave and go to Matthew 26 and 57 to see that interaction. So we, we've seen Annas. Annas can't find anything. He can't make any, any official charges. He can't, he can't pull anything on Jesus because he's trying to find something to kill him. He doesn't have anything. Let's see if Caiaphas can pull something out. See if they can conjure up something to, 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 to kill the Savior here. Matthew 26 and 57. It says, and those who have laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. They were already together, right? But Peter followed them at a distance at, at the high priest's courtyard. And he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now, the, the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death. They wanted somebody to lie for him. How can we cook this thing up, man? But found none. Phew. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But the last two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. They didn't get that part, did they? And the high priest arose and said to them, Do you answer nothing? What did these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power, right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes, saying that he has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of this witness? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered it and said, he is deserving of death. And then they spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? Terrible. Terrible. He was a man the other day. He was a man the other day. This is absolutely terrible. And notice that, that this meeting is a secret meeting. This is a secret meeting of the powers that be that have assembled in, in early morning, late, late night here. And like I said, this is like 2, 2, 3 in the morning maybe. And the problem with this, folks, this is very illegal for them to do. This is illegal for them. This is illegal. First of all, in their statutes, you can't charge a criminal at night. You can't have his trial at night. Second of all, capital crimes that they have were to be judged in the temple in the daytime publicly. And you'll notice that that is true because they wait until the next morning to cast their judgment. They could have just did it. They have him, right? They have him right here according to what they've decided. They have him right now. This is done. But they, don't, they reserve their judgment to the next day because that was a legal way to receive it. So even though they were crooked, even though they got themselves assembled and did some really, really illegal stuff, they said, well, we're going to wait tomorrow because we need to announce this to the public. Dirty dogs. Sanhedrin. The most holy people in all of that. So they hold their verdict. Sanhedrins hold their verdict to the next day because they have to. And there'll be basically a, a public interrogation. But that's what we see where Luke's going to pick up. But the decision's already been made. They've decided what they're going to do with him and what he's guilty of. And uh, if you would go back to Luke... Um, Really, all of that gets us where Luke actually starts. But those are the details that happen in between um, the verses here. And it says, verse 54 in Luke, 20, Luke 22 and 54, And having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house, but Peter followed them at a distance. Peter was concerned that, that, that uh, what was going to happen to the Savior. He was going to concern what was going on with him. He was concerned about what they were going to do, they were going to follow through. And I also think that he was also concerned of the promise that he made, that he wouldn't leave the Lord. He said, Lord, I, uh, if they take you to jail, I want to go with you. If they kill you, I want to die too. He, yeah, yeah, old Peter. A lot of confidence, isn't it? 
But here he is. He, 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 he's there, but he's not fully associating himself. He's keeping a distance from him, the Bible says right here. So he's following along and he's going, but he's not really with him here. And plus, I think maybe you know, if truly there's pride there with Peter, I think he may want to prove that he's going to keep his word. But I've got news for you. If you've ever made that promise to God, you've broke that promise. Just like the promise you said, I'll never do that again. Lord, please deliver me, bless me, forgive me. I'll never do it again. And you did it again the next Friday. <laughs> I mean, look at this. Look at verse 55. It says, now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Peter's hiding amongst them that are persecuting Jesus. And a good question might be, if you kind of follow this, think about, well, how did Peter actually get in there? Because, because Peter's got to, you got to enter into the courtyard. This is, this is an estate and, and you have to enter in. This is not like an open neighborhood like we have all like here because this is, this is the high priest. This is, this is very wealthy people. So all of this is gated here. So, so John, once again, go back to John 18, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John 18. He gives more details on how Peter got in this because th this is going to make, this is going to wrap our minds around it even more because this tells more of the story. Because if you watch the way that Luke gives, it looks like he denied, 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 but it's more of a story to how he's denying this and more people involved to his denial. John 18 and 15, verse 15, it says here, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Hmm. Now the disciple uh, was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Are we tracking? And then the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. And then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. And the servant and the officers who had made a fire of coal stood there, for it was cold, and uh, they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. So we, so we see this first denial that we'll see in Peter. It just, just says that the servant girl, but the truth is, Peter goes and enters into the courtyard by John. So Apostle John is the other disciple. So Peter is not by himself. John is there as well. Now, John somehow has some special relationship with them at the high priest's house. Because he knows the girl at the gate so well that Peter's on the outside and the girls question ourselves, this dude's Galilean. Are you one of those guys? Are you along with him? He thinks, she thinks that she recognizes him. And then, but John knows it well enough to let them in. So Peter says, no, he denies this girl. And we're going to see in Luke, it just mentions it, but this is the girl that's working the gate. This is the first denial. No, I don't, I don't know. Nope. I don't know. This is the first denial that we see in, in, in verse 56. And, and if you look at Luke 56, it says this, Luke 22 and 56, and the certain, certain servant, servant girl, seeing him uh, as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him. But he denied him saying, woman, I do not know him. Same girl. We believe this is the same girl. The same girl's being identified as the gatekeeper is also the same girl that identifies him. And what, what makes sense with the story, because there's some missing stuff in there, possibly that she sees him at the gate, thinks that's him. He says it's not her. He lets him in, and then she comes back and says, that's him. That's him, because she's loyal. That's him. He was with him, right? So he's amongst them. He's pointing out. So that was his denial. Look at 58, Luke uh, 22 and 58. It says, after a little while, another saw him and said, you also are of them. Peter said, man, I am not. Another denial. And then after about an hour had passed, after confidently affirming, saying, surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Once again, John 18 gives us a little more detail. Back to John 18 and 25. Look at this. I told you we were going to dance a little bit. I told you got dancing shoes on. John 18 and 25, it says, Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, You are not also one of the disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. That's the same second instance. And one of the servants, a servants of the high priest, the relative of him whom ear Peter cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the rooster crowed. The, 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 the denial was, was provoked here by a relative of the guy that Peter cut his ear off. He's like, I definitely know you. 
if somebody cut off your cousin's ear <laughs> and then the Lord put it back, you ain't going to forget them people. <laughs> he, I mean, ching, he's like, put it back on there. He didn't even say thank you whenever Jesus did that to you, if you saw that, by the way. But he's like, no, 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 no. You were the one. You were the one because you're all aggressive. We can forget you. And what's even more so is if, and we're not going to go there, but if you're taking notes, Matthew 26 and 74 said when this incident happened that Peter began to curse and swear. He was vehemently, just hard, pushing, aggressively denying Jesus to the point where he was cussing. That's some denial. That is a denial. Note takers, three different ways that Peter denied Jesus. The first way he denied him he denied him not knowing him. He said he didn't know him, right? Woman, I don't know him. Secondly, he denied him of being a follower of him. Man, I am not. I am not a follower of him. I don't know him, and I'm not following him. And thirdly and finally, he even denied <laughs> that he was in Galilee, that he's even from the same place. I'm not with him. I don't know him. I don't know what you're saying. I'm not Galilean. And you know, it's funny because in uh, Matthew 26 and 73, lets us know why they identified that he was Galilean because of his accent, the way that he spoke. Because even the girl at the gate was like, you're not one of them, are you? Because you listen to the way that he spoke. I mean, and that, that tell, and basically what it says, Matthew says, your words betray you. Because they identify where your origins are. If you talk to DJ, you can tell he's from Massachusetts, but he has a Rhode Island accent. I noticed that the first time I met him. <laughs> but he wants to park the car in the yard. So, I mean, and you see, you immediately know, oh, you're from up north. But it, 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 it automatically says a lot about you and where you're from, right? Now, you, you can't tell where I'm from. I'm from Myrtle Lake. You can't even tell. You can't tell where I'm from. But, but there's a lot of times you can hear people's voices, and it's a dead giveaway what region you're from. And I imagine particularly this, and this time was even stronger, because the world's a melting pot now. People are moving around, and it affects the way people's speech are, and people say things. But in this particular time, clearly identifying where you're from by the way that you say what you say and how you speak in your dialect. Definitely can tell a person from the South. Definitely. You know? Um, but it was a dead giveaway for them. Look at, look at verse 61. Uh, back in Luke, I, I hate these verses right here. I, I mean, I hate them, but just the way they made me feel when I read them. It says, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. So Peter's there, right? He's in the midst of there's a fire going on, and um, he's there, and he's been accused, right? He's been pointing his finger out. He's denied the Lord. Right? He's all there. All those that are judging him and beating him and spitting him are there. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. It's chilling to think of that thought of that eye contact of his face. You ever looked at someone, they look at you and you look at them and they know what you did to them and they know that you know that they know that you know? But what if it was God? And he, you know, is going through this and you're sitting there because he's watching, he's observing and the rooster crows and he sees you and you see them and immediately the revelation comes through that the prophecy that came to pass before you. What else would you do but crumble? I could imagine we've all made mistakes in our lives. We've all done things that we shouldn't have done. There's things that we've had to repent it from in the Lord's face. And he said, you were going to do this. I ain't going to do it. Multiple times, I ain't going to do it. I want to go. I want to die with you. I'm going to go to jail with you. He said, no, you're not. You're just going to deny me. Not even when there's a real threat, you're going to deny me. Folks, you know, when we sin, we deny him. When we refuse to repent, we deny him. And he's looking us right in our face when we look at the word of God the same way he was looking at Peter. I can't imagine what his face looked like.
but it must have been one that you will never forget. Couldn't imagine. All he could do was cry. So the practical message about what Peter's dealing with here is that we have to be careful, folks, to not allow ourselves to be overconfident in our spirituality. Now, I think that Peter's heart is definitely in the right place. He's like, I really want to stand for the Lord. I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to go there with you, God. I want to be there with you. I'm going to cut his ear off. I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do, but truly, truly, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is absolutely weak. Weak, feeble, and weak. But we found him sleeping, didn't he? When they should have been praying, they were sleeping. The flesh is weak. A couple of notes here that I wanted to pinpoint. Philippians 3 and 1 says this, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write you the same things to you is not tedious, but you for your safety. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoice Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Paul said, we're not to. All the things that are going on, all the spiritual challenges that you have, all the temptations you deal with, do not have confidence in your flesh. Do not be alone with that girl with your room door locked. Do not have a place where there's no boundaries for yourself because you are putting confidence in your flesh and you will fall. If you decide that you're strong enough to do it, you're in trouble right there. You failed immediately. You felt immediately, the very moment that I think that I'm strong enough to do anything, I've decided to have confidence and spiritual arrogance. Oh, I'm strong enough. Spiritual. I read, I did my devotion today. I must be strong enough. Boy, you're not. Because an apostle, a disciple that was with God for three and a half years, verbally just denied him. And we got this weird idea that we're strong enough to stand and do whatever it is. You don't, I don't, and we're fools if we think we do. I don't care how long you've been saved. Don't put confidence in your flesh. You'll get by with it. But eventually it'll weaken and then you'll fall and you'll crumble for sure. Amen? 1 Corinthians 10 and 12 says this, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. Folks, cover ourselves. Protect ourselves. Give boundaries for yourselves. Keep yourselves. Have accountability for yourselves. On Wednesday night, we were talking about who should be in this, who's to be in my circle of accountability. Who's the wise counsel for me in my life? We talked about this, and we identified all of these people that would be perfect for our lives. This stuff is important because why? We're subject to falling. We're subject to it. So we need help. Right? Galatians 6 and 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken, listen to this. If a man is overtaken by any trespasses, you who are spiritual, restore him, restore the one in such a spirit of gentleness, considering yourselves, lest you be tempted. Because we're all subject to the same thing. And we need each other. Paul also says this. Romans 12 and 3. For I say, though the grace is given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. When you start thinking that you're good and your stuff don't stink, you're in trouble. I don't need boundaries. I don't need nobody to tell me what to do. I'm strong enough. I don't need nobody to tell me how to live. That's arrogance and that's pride and you will fall. Peter. Peter. The leader of the church, when we get to the book of Acts, filled with the Spirit, speaking to the Sanhedrin, standing up to their face, crucified upside down, just fell in front of the Lord's face. And the Bible never gives us a pathway for us to be spiritually, overly spiritually confident. Now, spiritually confident, yes. But if you're mature and you're spiritually confident, you know that you need boundaries. You know that you need accountability. You know you need the word of God. You know that you need to pray. You know that you need help. You know that you need blessing. You know that you need people around you. You know that you can't be alone by yourself. You know that you have to be the word of God. You know that you have to be in church. You know that you have to get in the word and pray. You know, no, 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 no. You know that. And all of those things are built around you for safety because you and I are subject to fall. In the very moment we think that we're not, we're probably already on the ground already, just don't realize it. 
But Peter, spiritually confident, heart in the right place, humility. And it's very important that we also understand that this is a love story that comes back around where Peter's restored. Now, Peter's broken right now, and he's crying, he's weeping, because the very thing that he said that he would not do to God, he did it to him in his face. And he's broken about it. But it's okay. Right? Because Peter, I will tell you, is a lot stronger than the rest of them, because only Peter and John and the rest of them, the Bible says they scattered, they took off. He got arrested, he's like, you see all them dudes? We out of here. Right? And Jesus prophesied to them that they would do that. Think about something. You see these people that Jesus is around. You know, it's wrong for us to ever try to put a stipulation on people that we allow in our circle. We should be ministering to people that don't look like us, that are sinners, because it's work. Because when we see Jesus' ministry, that's all he did. Even those that claimed to be his disciples, the, the students, the disciplined ones, were a hot mess. But it didn't change him. He was still graceful. He still blessed them. He still kept them. And he still ministered to them. And that's how we should be. The Lord may have somebody in your life. Maybe they're sinners and they're a mess. But the Lord's brought them to them for you to witness. You know, like, it doesn't make a person, you can't say a person's not worthy to be a part of your life because you, you gave them the gospel, they didn't get saved, so now you don't have nothing to do with them. It's like, I make the standard of you being in my life. But what you'll find out is those people that are watching you will tell you a lot about yourself. And it's helpful. Because they need to see your life over an extended period of time. Some people have been through a lot. Some people, you'll walk right up. They're ready to receive God, save them. Some people is like, listen, I never read the Bible, but I see how you love people. I see how you care for people. I say you forgive people. That's the witness too, y'all. So, I mean, there's a mixture of people we should have in our lives. 63. Verse 63. Hey, listen to this. And, and, and review yourself, right? We'll take communion. Most of the time, we, before we take communion, we have an opportunity to, to evaluate yourself. We'll, we'll do that next week. But mature believers are always evaluating themselves. Am I allowing myself to get spiritually, you know, spiritually snooty? Am I allowing myself? You know, I went on a fast. I'm feeling on a high. It's just a higher place for you to fall. So be wise. Amen? Amen. Look at verse 63. And then the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. Uh, we're, we're back in Luke. I'm sorry. Luke, Luke uh, 22, 63. Now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. And having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? And many others, and many other things, they blasphem blasphemously spoke against him. So even though that Luke didn't record the, the nighttime trial, he's now in the daytime trial, the official trial that is here, and they're beating him and they're wearing him out. And they're, you know, they're, even I think Matthew said they're spitting in his face, they're mocking him, they're making fun of him as being the king of the Jews, and, and, and they're saying, prophesy, he struck you. Of course, man, Jesus can say one thing. He can call uh, legions of angels down and just level this whole situation here. And they're arrogantly, like, beating him, not realizing, you know, who they're really beating. If he wanted to just get himself free, just could. But he's doing the will of the Father. And he's taking on this abuse and this pain, a man of many sorrows here. But this is the true definition of meekness. When we, when we look at the Greek translation for meekness, this is the example of it because meekness is not weakness. It is that he has the ability and the power to overcome them with ease, but yet he doesn't. He endures the cost for you and I. This is true meekness on display, and he is taking it in. And as soon as, verse 66, and as soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and the scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, Sanhedrin, once again, is gathered together in this session because this, this Jesus thing is just way too much for them. They, they said this to him, if you are the Christ, tell us, who are you? But he said to them, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. And listen to this for a moment. The reason why I'm telling you is for you to believe, but I know you're not going to. And if I ask, if I also ask you, will you by no means answer me or let me go? Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the God of power. Then all of them said, are you then the Son of God? 
So he said to them, you rightly said that I am. And they said, what further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. Peter denied him. Jesus didn't deny himself. He couldn't. He said, this is who I am. This is who I am. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to pull any punches. This is who I am. And you know what, y'all? That's how we should be. You know? Cookout's coming up. You know? People asking about your life and who you represent. Like, this is who I am. Jesus here is the Messiah. Even though they got an illegal trial going on and they put this and cook this thing together, he is, not, he is not denying who he is and what his calling is and purpose is. He didn't do it. Because in his eyes, first of all, he knew what he had to do. He accepted that judgment and in, even him confessing wouldn't change any of their minds. And here's the thing, and this is the reason why he said that is because technically, right, they were all waiting for the Messiah. If he truly confessed and he, he was the Messiah, then they all should have stopped and worshipped him. But it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. Who are you in Christ? Is that your confession? Is that your life? Or do you, when it's convenient, deny him by your actions? We might not be like Peter when we, we don't say it, but we might deny it by how we act. Because what we believe is what we do. It is how we live our lives. Are we in denial of him? Because he's looking at us. When the conviction of the Holy Spirit is in our heart, when the word of God is in our face, he's facing us. He's looking at us. The beautiful thing is the same grace that he offers Peter, he offers you and I. And all you got to do is ask for forgiveness. He'll wash you and cleanse you and restore you. Let's stand to our feet. Father, we thank you, Lord. That you are faithful, Lord, and you're kind and you're just in all your ways. Let us have the spiritual strength to confess you, but have the humility to protect ourselves with boundaries, with accountability, with help, with your word, with prayer, Lord. For we're weak and feeble if we're honest. And we're in desperate need of your strength and your help, Lord. Help us to do your will. Help us to not try to do things our way, but to do things your way. Help us, Father God, to be strengthened and to be built up in a beautiful way in you. That not just because of our lips, but because of our feet. Let our feet worship you the same way our lips worship you. And let us repent if our feet deny you and our lips worship you. Because all of us denial. Lord, help us, Father God, to do what it is we know in our heart to be right and to be pleasing to you. Give us the strength by the Holy Spirit to go past those things which we fall and forgive us of our sins. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, today for this message. We thank you for the truth that is here. Let us all be convicted in one way or another that we might come closer to you, Lord. Let us not be offended, Lord, by your truth, but let us be pricked and desiring cleaning by your spirit. So we thank you for it, Lord, and we bless you for it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen.